information, although I'm going to share a lot of information with you. I've got slides I'm going to pull up here, um, but I do want you to feel like you can share. I also want to up front let you know that there are a couple of slides um, that might be upsetting um, that talk about um, some kind of rough things. Um, so if you, you know, have sensitivity, I just want to give you advance warning that there could be you know, some upsetting content and I don't want to do anything that's upsetting to anybody. Um, okay, so let's get started. And for those of you who don't know me and you're thinking like, why is this person talking to me about profound autism? Um, my name's Judith Ursetti and I'm a certified public accountant. <laughs> Very exciting. Um, so we are not going to talk about depreciation today. Thank goodness. Um, I was inspired um, back in 2005 to get into autism advocacy um, because my son Jack was diagnosed um, with autism at the age of two. And, you know, I didn't know anything about autism and I'm still learning. And it's been, you know, 18 years since he was diagnosed. A few, few years later, my daughter, Amy, was also diagnosed when she was in the fourth grade. Um, Jack was diagnosed like kind of what we call level three, Amy level one. Um, I became very involved in advocacy, left the sexy world of accounting <laughs> to really work on advocacy full time. And um, I was employed by Autism Speaks for 13 years working on passing autism insurance laws and Medicaid coverage um, requirements in the states. Maryland is a state where I worked with many of you, um, and we're actually still working on some things in Maryland related to mental health parities. So anyway, that's why I'm here. Um, this is actually my son, Jack, <laughs> of course, on the, the cover slide. Um, this past year, I'm going to be really frank with all of you. Um, it's been a little bit more than a year ago. Um, my son, Jack, who is a phenomenal human being, started having some really severe self-injury. I don't know if any of you are self-advocates who've experienced self-injury or any of you are caregivers who are caring for someone who has self-injury, um, but it's it's really hard. You know, there are different kinds of self-injury. Self My son, Jack, started biting his tongue. And so his tongue became so injured that he couldn't eat. And he lost 20 pounds. And we bounced around here, there, and everywhere trying to find some help for that. And I just ran into the kind of reminder that we're in the too bad category, like, oh, we really don't know what to do with that. Oh, go see this person, go see that person. But it was just this hamster wheel of not knowing how to help this human being who was suffering. And um, so that really motivated me to start the Profound Autism Alliance. Um, does the world need another autism or disability nonprofit? Probably not. But I was kind of super worried that there was so much toxicity in the world um, and people just fighting about who owns autism and what the conversation should be and who's more important and who's suffering more. So I really wanted to focus on compassion for the entire spectrum, clarity of the issues that we face in respectful ways and progress. So that's why we started the Profound Autism Alliance. Um, the goal of the, today's presentation is to tr try to be respectful, but provide really accurate information. I'm not a doctor or a lawyer. I'm a very boring accountant and one of those annoying moms <laughs> who likes to talk about <laughs> autism advocacy um, and policy. So um, that's why I'm here. And as I said before, you know, I don't want to upset anyone, but I am going to provide some case studies um, already have a little bit that could be upsetting. So I just want to provide a little bit of a warning there. We're going to talk about this new definition of profound autism. I'm curious, um, I don't know if you guys want to put in the chat what you think profound autism is or isn't. Um, I'd love for you to do that if you're interested. Um, learn why I think the new definition is needed um, and learn how to better support this population, no matter what you want to call them. Um, so Anyway, let's talk about 
we're going to get down in the wonky weeds for a minute and talk about autism spectrum disorder, the definition and the related representation. Okay, so autism, as probably most of you know, is defined in this book. I've got one on my desk. I have a pocket DSM. <laughs> it's very interesting. Um, anyway, the Diagnostic um, and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders from the American Psychiatric Association, that is where the term autism spectrum disorder is defined. Um, and it's broken out into the three levels that you see on the screen. You have level one autism um, and people who meet the criteria for level one um, without supports in place, they have noticeable impairment in social communication, difficulty in initiation, response and social communication, may appear to have decreased interest in social interactions, inflexibility of behavior causes significant interference with functioning in one or more contexts, difficulty switching between activities, problems of organization and planning can hamper independence. So that's the wonky American psychiatric description of what they call level one autism. Um, level two is kind of a little bit more impaired. And then level three, you can see in the description there, it's the same sorts of impairments, but just how they label as more severe. And they talk about great, dis great distress, um, things like that. So you have level one, level two, level three that's in the DSM. I wonder how many of you think that this is a good description of autism or if you find ways that it's lacking. I think there's a lot of opinions out there about the DSM and, and what it needs or what it doesn't. To me though, when you think about autism, if I'm talking to someone at the grocery store or family member and you talk with someone outside of the autism community, even inside the autism community, it sort of reminds me of the reality of shows like this one, Friends, um, which a lot of people have been thinking about lately because Matthew Perry, unfortunately, died recently. Um, whenever you watch Friends, I don't know if any of you have ever thought about this, but, you know, they're a group of like 20 somethings. They live in these apartments in New York City. And if you look at the apartments, they're like really nice expensive apartments but most of the time the friends you know are between jobs or relationships like they just don't seem to be realistically able to afford the kind of life that they're living hanging out at the coffee shop and living in these really expensive apartments so there's a perception of like oh this is what life in new york city's like for a 20 something and we all know probably that if you're 20 and you're living in New York and you're like most people you're living like in one room with a sink and it's a really different perception um so i feel like autism and the way it's depicted sometimes in the media is like that it sort of gets it but not totally um and i think you know we all kind of have our favorite presentations. One of my favorites was recently on Amazon Prime. It was called As We See It. I don't know if any of you saw that series. It was so good. Um, I really liked it. Um, my first um, exposure to autism, I'm old, was on Rain Man. I actually saw that movie at the theater. That's how old I am. Um, people watch The Good Doctor, Love on the Spectrum. There's a Muppet with autism. Um, and I think all these things are really good um but then they also kind of provide this perception to the public to policymakers people in state legislatures and federal legislature um who make decisions the people have this perception about autism that maybe doesn't apply to the person in your life who has autism or you if you have autism um, there's also really preeminent humanity out there who are changing the world, who are autistic. Greta Thunberg, she tweeted um, that having Asperger's means she's sometimes different from the norm, but under the right circumstances, being different can be a superpower, um, which is true and amazing. So that's one face of autism. I don't know if any of you have ever, I'm not a TikTok person, I think, but Paige Lale is on Instagram too. So I guess that's where I see TikTok stuff. Um, but she says she was diagnosed with autism at age 15. She has millions of followers. She's an influencer. 
She says about her autism, I'm overly social. I give way too much eye contact. I'm really good in social situations. So her experience is really different than, you know, probably Greta's or someone else. Um, this is my friend, Moo Muhammad Amalidi. He um, is a 15 year old with um, autism that presents in a way where he's nonverbal. Um, he presents with a pretty profound intellectual disability. He loves music. Um, he loves to be out in the community. Um, so, you know, he's not, you know, making speeches like Greta is, or he's not influencing on TikTok like Paige is, but he's in the world, you know, in his own space with his communication device, um, making his presence known. So that's another kind of autism, autism spectrum disorder. Um, his experience though, is one that has really affected me as a human being um, because his mom, Feta, was a good friend of mine. That's a picture of her with me. And we were in Washington, DC with our friend Arzu. We were advocating on a piece of federal legislation related to autism. Um, and Feta is from California and she is just a force. Um, when it comes to trying to fight for Medicaid coverage for people with autism and private health insurance coverage for supports and services that are super important. Um, Feta, um, a few years ago, she and Moo um, were at home and um, it was in September of 2020. I'll never forget this. Um, she was home. Moo was upstairs asleep. Uh, the whole family was. Feta was. Moo was. Um, Feta's sister and her niece were also living with them um, in California, in Fremont, California. And unfortunately, a fire broke out. And so Feta and her sister and her niece all got out of the, ho out of the house quickly um, and saw that the house was engulfed. And Mu was still inside upstairs in his room. And so Feta um, ran back in to get Mu, ran upstairs. Um, and we don't know exactly what happened, but what we do know is that when Feta and Moo were found by the firefighters, their arms were around each other in Moo's room. She could not persuade him to leave, um, because of just his presentation and his way of experiencing the world. So sometimes autism is wonderful and it's a superpower. Sometimes it can limit perception and, you know, affect how you take action to be safe. And so the world lost two incredible human beings. Um, and I think it's so important that people know about people like Feta and Moo. They should still be here and they're not. And the type of autism that Moo lived with and the type of autism that Feta advocated around is what I want to talk about today. And just this evolving terminology around it. That terminology, I think, really needs to be based on individual experiences. Um, so one thing that happened related to all of this terminology and evolution um, is a bunch of really fancy scientists and self-advocates all got together um, and created the Lancet Commission about research, the future of care and research and supports and services for autism. Um, and you can see, and I'm gonna circulate these slides. So if you really wanna geek out and look at the members of the Lancet Commission, you will find self-advocates, you will find doctors, you will find researchers. It's an international group, um, as I said, very fancy, smart, intelligent people. Um, and they're really trying to seek solutions around autism. And they had a lot of recommendations. So their recommendations around language weren't the only recommendations they made, but that's the one that I'm gonna talk about today. Um, so they did make a recommendation. They said, first of all, increased awareness has not been in accompanied by improvements and services to support autistic individuals and their families. Can I get an amen to that? I mean, I think that's true. I think we've made some progress because of increased awareness, but it's not anywhere close to what it needs to be. The Lancet Commission on the Future of Care and Clinical Research in Autism, their purpose, as they state here, aims to answer the question of what can be done 
in the next five years to address the current need of autistic people and families worldwide. So they're like, okay, listen, there's awareness, there's research going on, there's efforts going on, flitting around, but what can we actually do in the next five years to really shake things up and make a change? So one thing that they said was they wanted to introduce a new definition. Um, the commission proposes that the designation of profound autism be adopted as an administrative term to apply to children and adults that require 24 access to an adult who can care, can care for them if concerns arise. And it's adults who are unable to be left completely alone in a residence and un, unable to take care of basic daily adaptive needs. So I feel like that's a mouthful. Like if someone said, hey, what's profound autism? And you spit out this definition, it, I feel like that's a lot. And I think it fosters a lot of confusion, although I get where they're coming from. This is definitely the type of autism that my amazing son has. For me, um, if you really wanna bring that down to one sentence that people can just use and understand, um, it's that autistic people who require 24 seven care every day of their lives have profound autism. So, you know, it's people who, some people need 24 seven care at certain times in their lives. Certain autistic people are like that. That's not the segment of the population that this definition is talking about. Although that segment really matters. This one is the one that for a human being, who always has and always will need that 24 seven care. That's what they meant by profound autism. And Dr. Kathy Lord, who chaired the Lancet Commission, um, Professor Catherine Lord, PhD. Um, I talked with her about my little summary here and she said, that's perfect, that's it. So. Here to four, feel free to use this sentence if you think it's easier and it makes sense to you. But that's the key. It's for people with autism who can't be left alone. They need 24 seven care throughout their lives. Um, and again, I wanna say that doesn't minimize the needs of others, but it's just a way to be clear about what we're talking about. This term is not appropriate for young children. So attaching the term profound autism to like a three or four year old, when you really don't know yet where they're going developmentally, even, you know, people who are older, you don't completely know where they're going developmentally. Like that's always changing and they're always teaching us things, but young children developing language and skills and ways to connect, you can't really apply a profound term to them usually when they're young. And it's not intended to describe other really severe difficulties that are related to autism um, people have extraordinary life circumstances, trauma, family conflict, scarcity of resources, co-occurring mental health problems. Those things are devastating. They matter. This particular term is not trying to capture that. Those are important, but they're just kind of other categories, not what we're talking about here. Um, and why in the world do we need this? Why can't we just talk about autism and everyone just advocate together on all things um, clarity, I think, is really needed. And I'm going to talk to you more about that moving forward. This is about clarity. It's not about competition. The reality is that people with profound autism consistently experience unique, disabling, and often unseen challenges, safety, intense behaviors. Like I talked about my son's tongue biting. You all may have some experiences you don't feel that you can share because they're difficult and devastating. Um, these things require immediate and substantive solutions. Um, so I say this really in a self-serving kind of a way. As I said, we started Profound Autism Alliance because of this severe tongue biting and the lack of resources and the lack of research being done. So if we're going to talk about this population and the things they experience, we don't need to, it, it's it makes it harder if you have to explain in three paragraphs the type of person you're talking about. If you can just say, I'm talking about someone with profound autism, then you know that's a human being who's autistic, who always has and always will need 24 seven care. 
So it's all about clarity. It's not about competition. Um, and we talk about competition, um, the reality right now too, as the spectrum has evolved and broadened is that the proportion of research that's going on, some of you may be into research, some of you might not. If you're into research though, this is really important. Like the proportion of studies that include those with profound autism has decreased significantly over time. Um, in fact, research indicates now that only about 6% of clinical studies on autism, 6% include people who always have and always will need 24 seven support. Research generally will include clinical research, um, will include people who can come in, provide consent, follow instructions, do things, and they are the participants in clinical research. That's why they're the 94%. The 6%, very hard to pull in and there's no incentive to do it because we don't even have a term to describe who they are and track the, this disparity. So if you're going to be able to help this population, in addition to research and advocacy that's done for the whole spectrum, we need to have some specialized research. We need to have ways to include people like my son, Jack, and other people with profound autism in clinical research so they can have support, so they can feel better, they can be valued, connect, they can have health, um, they deserve that. The continuing increased recognition of profound autism will open the doors to more inclusive research. Only then can targeted advocacy increase access to critically needed supports and services for this marginalized population. As I mentioned before, I got excited and got ahead of myself. People with profound autism are not usually included in autism research studies that you hear about on the news. Um, forgive me too for my constant personal references, but my daughter was a neuroscience major at Emory University. And while she was there, she did research on how autistic people experience pain. And because of the way um, the institutional review board, you know, looked at her research, it had to be designed in a way that people like her brother could not be included. So the research that she did there, she could not include people like her brother, even though she very much was motivated to do that research because she wanted to try to see how people with autism experience pain, pain more about self-injury. She later has done research um, with Boston Medical Center um, around autism friendly hospitals and things like that. Um, and they had um, groups that they interviewed, focus groups, autistic individuals to try to get their experiences to inform what an autism friendly hospital setting should look like. Um, that too, you know, there are some valuable voices providing perspective, but no one like her brother was represented. Um, no one with profound autism. So we're creating these spaces we're doing this research, but we're leaving out a very important subset of people. And we've got to do something about that. The CDC has done a little bit of research on this. Um, they took that Lancet definition and they applied it to their autism prevalence reports. And they said, okay, how many of the one in 36 people who have autism would fall into this category of profound autism? This came out in April of 2023, the CDC, um, and they said 26.7% of people who were autistic, so basically one in four, fall into that profound autism category. I think what was really discouraging to me at that time, the CDC came out with this report. I wonder how many of you heard about it at that time. Like, it was really buried. You know, again, I feel like people just don't want to talk about profound autism for some reason. Um, some people find it stigmatizing, like, oh, no, 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 don't say that. The reality is people with profound autism are amazing and cool. There should not be stigma attached. There are many people who have autism, intellectual disability, severe challenging behavior, who are incredible people, but having profound needs does not make them less human. But 
this report really none of the large autism organizations did any sort of release on it just kind of came and went and so again a profound autism alliance we really want to get the word out there the cdc is doing work on this we want to do more work to even further refine this but it really does confirm that there's a big chunk of the population who falls into the profound category um, and again, I'm going to send these slides around if you want to really click through and read the research. Um, so as I mentioned, we did form the Profound Autism Alliance to try to address this in a positive way. We're committed to the recognition of the unique challenges that people with profound autism and intellectual disability experience. We want to improve their health. We want to improve their connection. And we want to see inclusive research and focused advocacy that will result in meaningful services and supports for them. So no apologies for them. And I want to say we're not against anyone. We don't want to take anything away from anyone else. But I think we can add to the conversation, provide clarity, and move forward and make things better for this population. Um, before I, I want to make sure I'm addressing what's in the chat. Do we have questions before I keep going? Nothing like talking at people. <laughs> so far, we don't have any questions. Okay. All um, right. Thank Alyssa you. did say that that definition works well to describe her son. Um, Good. Alyssa said that her 22-year-old profoundly autistic son was able to participate in a study at one time. Good. That's good. We need, to, we need more studies like that. I'd love to hear more about it. Um, all right, so our vision, I'm gonna talk about Profound Autism Alliance for just a little bit, is all about compassion, clarity, and progress. So we envision a world where people with profound autism and their families are empowered, understood, supported in every aspect of life. So for those of you who live in this world, um, I know you, I think many of us connect via social media channels because that's the only way we can. There's so much isolation. There's so much family trauma. There's so much exclusion. It's just, there's just so much lack of acknowledgement, I feel like, for this population. Um, and so we want to have a world where this population is really acknowledged and compassion is extended to them. Clarity, as I keep mentioning, recognition of the unique challenges that people with profound autism experience. You know, if you are living a life where you need 24 seven care throughout your life, that experience is unique. It's not the same as someone who might need support sometimes or someone who needs support very little. And again, those people matter and have different needs, but that 24 seven life across your life and what's needed, the resources that are needed to provide that across the lifespan. I think many of us are here too. Some of you may have younger people with profound autism in your life. For those of us who are now, you know, caring for our adults who have profound autism, when you think about resources across their life, you really start thinking about resources as you age and think about what in the world is going to happen when I'm not here to be that 24 seven caregiver, like what is gonna happen? So that clarity is so needed and we want to see progress, like not something vague, <laughs> but something real. And so we wanna improve health for people with profound autism. If you can't communicate, if you struggle and you need 24 seven care, your health is gonna suffer. Or if you're constantly stressed out, because you're in this terrible OCD loop or something, your health is going to suffer. The health of the people around you is going to deteriorate. And then also connection, real progress can be monitored that way. How isolated are we? Are people with profound autism able to be in the community as much as they are comfortable? Like, what does that look like? Are they seen? Are they really a part of supports and services? How many of you have been rejected by a school? by a day have, by a program that's supposed to be autism friendly. These are the things that we wanna to work to fix. Connection and health are so important. 
So that's our vision. Um, our focus here, are just some things I've mentioned before already. I'm like a broken record. You're like, why in the world do you have your rings on here? So this is just an example. This was Wednesday, November 1st. We went and did Hill visits. We've been going to Washington, D.C., visiting with members of Congress over the last few months, talking to them about profound autism. There's a lot of disability advocacy that takes place in the nation's capital. And most of it is around neurodiversity, neurodivergence, acceptance, and celebration. And there's a time and a place for that. But we also want them to know about the trauma, the isolation, the suffering that is occurring everywhere. And we want to try to find solutions. And so on this particular day, we had, we walked six miles, like around the, just going from building to building, meeting with legislators, 15,000, almost 16,000 steps. Um, so we're doing that. Like we're next week, I'll be back in DC again, visiting legislators. We also have um, a grassroots network that we've built. It's called Voter Voice. You can sign up for it. Some of you probably already have. So it makes it super easy for you to sit at your keyboard um, and just type a message to your legislator because you put your address in there. It already automatically finds out who represents you and you can share your story. And I'll have some links for you later about that. But we're just trying to provide that opportunity to share your realities so they understand it. If they don't hear it, they're not going to do anything about it. And we're also about inclusive research. Obnoxious mom here. I've got Amy, my daughter, with this is her research that she did on how people with autism experience pain. But um, just ongoing efforts there around research to figure out like why, what is happening? Why, you know, are some people affected in this way? What can we do to help them? Um, research is funded in great part in the United States through the federal government. And the first autism research bill federally was a bill that was called the Combating Autism Act. And it was passed in 2006. So my son, Jack, who's pictured here, he was diagnosed in 2005. Um, and so during that time, the Combating Autism Act was being drafted. And um, one of the congressmen in Texas, Congressman Joe Barton, um, blocked the bill from passage. He chaired the committee that it needed to go through and he blocked it. Um, and so this is a real throwback. This was in Dallas. We lived there at the time. Um, we had like a rally where we're, you know, saying pass the combating autism act to fund autism research. Um, and Joe Barton did finally um, give in. And so the Combating Autism Act was passed. And now that is known as the Autism Cares Act. That language has cha was changed. People found it, you know, combating autism to be offensive. So it changed. The spectrum has broadened. So now, even though back then, you know, we were advocating before it's too late, you know, autism silenced our children, kind of a different um, language. Now it only 6% of autism research includes people like with profound autism, um, even though one out of every four people with autism are profoundly affected. So we've been visiting the Hill. We've been trying to collaborate with other organizations um, to get their buy-in too, because it's very difficult to do these kind of things alone. So autism cares, which is that bill that started back in 2006, here we are like all these years later, fighting um, for it to be reauthorized. But if it's gonna be reauthorized, it really needs to recognize the one in four people who require that lifetime care. Um, and it doesn't, it really doesn't. When you think about the 6% of studies only including people with profound autism, a lot of that is driven by the funding that's being flowed through the Autism Cares Act and what they authorize. And so we're advocating, this is a picture of our one pager, to have specific language in the reauthorization this year that recognizes profound autism and says, we're gonna do specific work and research on this population. So that's our ask. We are not very popular in the broader autism community because the other organizations are looking at us saying, oh, you're gonna screw things up. We just wanna reauthorize this, don't rock the boat. And I don't wanna do anything that's harmful to any, I want research to continue for others, but status quo 
is just not acceptable. We really have to let members of Congress know what's happening to people with profound autism. And we must have some allocated funding to research that's not just pie in the sky stuff, but is really meaningful for this community. So we're working very hard on that. And you guys are Maryland. So if you're ever interested in going to the Hill with me to talk to legislators, please let's do it. I would love to do it. Another place where we're present is INSAR, the International Society of Autism Research. They meet once a year. It's a lot of fancy autism scientists, you know, talking about things that a lot of the time I don't understand. <laughs> um, but again, it's so important that we're there because again, people are presenting around groundbreaking research and we can't allow them to forget this population. Um, many researchers don't have a personal connection to autism and they just want to do research. They want to do the work. They don't really know who they're doing it for. And so for us, we want to be present. So we were there in Austin. We were there in Stockholm this coming year. They're actually going to have a section focused on profound autism at NSAR, which is huge. The fact that they're acknowledging that and they're having a whole section on it is huge. That's great. The hard part is that NSAR is in Australia this year. So we've got to figure out how we're going to pay for plane tickets, but we're going to work very hard to be there just reminding researchers, please don't forget profound autism. Okay. We talked about advocacy. We've talked about research. I want to talk about what profound autism can do for you. I also want to say too that Pathfinders is amazing and I know they provide tons of resources for the entire spectrum. So when I talk about what we're doing, this is just a little niche thing. Please, Pathfinders deserves your support and they provide all kinds of amazing resources. I've worked with Pathfinders, I think since 2008. So <laughs> I'm a big, big fan. One thing I want to make sure you're aware of, if you're a caregiver of someone with profound autism, no matter what their age um, we have this secret Facebook group. Some of you are already in it um, that we screen tightly um, and we don't allow many promotions or spam. It's not for the whole autism community. It's just for caregivers of people with profound autism. So it's not for providers of people with profound autism. It's just for caregivers. And in this space, it's safe and you can really talk about things that you can't talk about anywhere else. And we want to be able to provide that support. So it's there. Um, and if you are a caregiver of someone with profound autism, please join. It, we would love to have you. And it's just nice to be able to go somewhere at three o'clock in the morning <laughs> when you're up, you know, and say, hey, <laughs> who else is up to or what's going on? Um, my daughter, Amy, is um, developing a sibling action network. Her experience with sibling stuff in the disability community, everybody has their own perspective, but she kind of has never really found her spot there. And so she really wanted to create one that's specific to profound autism. So we're doing that. One thing I really love is the Dignity Project. I think people will understand profound autism and we can really talk about it. You know, when we need to, we need to be able to share the experiences and the stories um, we probably, you know, in the safe space can talk about and laugh about and cry about things, but in the broader world, some of it is just not acceptable. Even people in the disability community will kind of attach some shame if you share too much, right? So finding that line. So we've created a place at Profound Autism Alliance. It's called the Dignity Project, where people can share personal stories they can share photos, videos, stories, short, long. Um, you can do that, it anonymously or you can share your identity, but we wanna have that library of stories that we can share and we can share them with legislators when they're like, what are you talking about? What's profound autism? I shared a little bit of my story with Jack and his tongue, which has been so hard and we're still struggling for answers on that. Um, but we wanna have stories like that from, our community ready to share so that we we're calling that the dignity project. We want to do it in a way that doesn't make the person with profound autism look less than human. Like some of the things I see are sort of cringeworthy to me when people talk about their loved ones, like they're objects or something. I don't know. 
I, you, uh, hopefully you understand what I'm getting at. I want to share these stories in a way that continues to protect human dignity, but it's also really real. So walk in that line. So if you want to help with that, we need it. Um, the other thing we're doing is we are funding our first research project. Look at all these words. <laughs> that's that's too many words. You're going to be like, I have no idea what she's talking about. So Echo Autism, we're funding, this is a three-year program. And a simple explanation is that it's going to be, there's a curriculum that's being written around intense behaviors, you know, related to things like profound autism. And we want to make sure that to start with, psychiatrists and neurologists are exposed to information about profound autism and intense behaviors, and that they are trained in how to respond and actually help. Now, they're not going to have a magic wand. We don't have that. But how many times, if you've been in a crisis, have you reached out to a neurologist or a psychiatrist and they really have had nothing to give except to tell you to go get on a wait list somewhere or go to the emergency room and wait. You know, those things aren't acceptable. So once we have the curriculum written over the next three years, twice a month, we're going to have a meeting of psychiatrists and neurologists. And at each of those meetings that happen twice a month, we're going to discuss a case of intense behaviors, profound autism. The group is going to problem solve on the case. And then everyone who's part of it leaves with practical, meaningful information. And that gets disseminated out. Any neurologist or psychiatrist can join this community. It's not open yet to join. I'll let everybody know when it is. Um, right now, the curriculum is being written, just kind of like the basic stuff. But hopefully this group will inform each other and then they'll also identify more gaps. It'll just lead to more meaningful help. Is this the end all be all? No. Do there need to be other intense behavior groups talking to each other? Yes. This is just where we're starting um, because not everyone can go, you know, to Kennedy Krieger or, you know, all these places where people just languish on waiting lists. So we're trying to get help out everywhere. Um, so that is We've started that work now, we've funded it, and I'm very proud um, that we're doing this. This started as a result of a meeting um, at INSAR in Austin, where about 100 people got together and said, what do we need to do about intense behavior and like, profound autism? And so this was um, an actionable item out of that, and Profound Autism Alliance is very happy to be funding that work. Um, okay, we're on Facebook, we're on TikTok, Instagram, I'm not on TikTok, but we are. Um, Twitter, we do have an executive director too. Kimberly Dick works full-time for Profound Autism Alliance. Some of you know Kimberly, she's amazing. Um, you can email us at info at profoundautism.org. Um, and then I also have the links here for the Caregivers Connected Dignity Project. Please share your story with your members of Congress. When you click on this link, it takes you to a page and it helps you. If you think like, oh my gosh, I wouldn't even have known what to say. It tells you what, to, how you can tell your story. This is so important. They need to be hearing from you. And if you want to get our newsletter, please sign up for that too. Um, and with that, I'm going to leave that up actually and kind of look at the chat. Um, are there any questions? Okay. Yeah. I see where Shannon is talking about her daughter biting her hands and arms for the last two years. Yeah. So very similar. Um, yes. And Kennedy Krieger, um, they're definitely going to be participating in the echo. Um, Lee Wachtel um, just didn't want to lead it. Kristen soul and is a pediatrician who's going to be pulling the curriculum together. And then Matthew Siegel who's a psychiatrist um, who specializes in severe challenging behavior and autism, he's working on it. So, and Lee Wachtel is gonna be part of it. She's just not leading it. Um, okay, and then people are just making comments. And yes, Helen, we are gonna have links to the groups. Um, that is coming. Okay, yes, Chris, you're talking about how our kids have been kicked out of programs. I think it's interesting. Like even when my son was young, he got kicked out of like the preschool kind of programs. And now 
Um, we have programs um, that you have to, if he's going to be included in a program, we have to provide his own support. And then if he has any type of severe or challenging behaviors, he can't be there. It's just like, oh, you know, the exclusion is baffling to me. Um, all right. I don't know if we can unmute or if there are questions. I don't want to miss anyone. Yeah, and Judith, so far you've answered everything that was in the chat. <laughs> okay, great. All right. Well, that is all I had to present today. I got finished, I think, a little bit early. Um, I want to say thank you. It's always hard to sit and listen and be talked at. Alyssa, I appreciate the um, definition that you provided too. Very helpful. More knowledge, the better. Um, I will circulate all these slides to everyone or I'll send them. Um, yeah. Hi, yeah, Judith, well, if you send that to us, we'll make sure that everyone that was actually registered will get it. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a couple other little comments, if you don't mind me sharing with you or questions. Please. Yeah, please. Okay. Um, so someone was asking, will there be an effort to, through your program, to increase people going into the field of behavior support? Um, so not the particular echo that's for psychiatrists and neurologists like MDs, but definitely moving forward, we're going to have other echo programs, training programs for people that would go, you know, into the behavioral field. We're going to try, as I mentioned earlier, we're all about like health and connection. So absolutely. Um, so stay tuned. Um, right now we're just doing the psychiatrists and neurologists, but more to come. Um, the other thing I'll mention too, while you're looking, Trish, yes. and Trish and I have known each other since 1942, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, is that I, for 2024, uh, made the very difficult decision to leave my full-time position at the Council of Autism Service Providers. I've worked there for the last few years doing government relations. Um, and before that, I was at Autism Speaks for 13 years. But I am leaving CAS and I am going to be working on the Profound Autism Alliance full time. Um, I think this is important work. I think the time is now. Um, and I want to try to move forward with meaningful advocacy. I think all the toxicity online doesn't really get us anywhere. I think we need to be in DC meeting with legislators. I think we need to be having experiences like this where we can share information and stories. We need to provide support. We need to be training healthcare providers. So I'm gonna be focusing on that, um, which is a little scary because <laughs> um, I'm just in charge of myself. Um, so our website is almost ready. It's going to have resources, lots of information, and I need your constant help to make it better. So please stay in touch with me. That's going to launch, I'd say probably in a couple of weeks. And I really love it. I think you're going to love it too. So the website is coming and hopefully those with profound autism are really going to feel represented and supported. So someone's asking for information on the Facebook group, and I know you um, are going to be sending yeah. the it's PowerPoint. That, yeah, it's the one, it's called Caregivers Connected. Um, and um, please join that group. You'll have to be approved to get in. Like we, we keep it tight. We don't want people coming in there, storing up trouble or people in there who aren't living your experience. So um, I'll send you the link and then just make sure and answer the questions that it asks you. If you don't answer the questions, you will get rejected because we want to make sure we know who's in there. So answer the questions and then we'll pull you right in and hopefully you'll find some more people that you can relate to. Thank you everybody so much for listening today.